Welcome everyone to this CUBE conversation discussing the state of transparency in cybersecurity. I'm your analyst and host, Rob Streche. I'm joined today by Suzanne Spaulding, former Undersecretary for Cyber and Infrastructure at the Department of Homeland Security, and Carl Windsor, Senior Vice President of Product Technology and Solutions at Fortinet. Welcome both of you. Hello. Hey, Rob. I'm excited for this because I, I think, again, this is one of those, I, I think, really big moments in cyber uh, that really is about how are we going to really achieve better resilience within our products and how are we going to really get together. Uh, here at the Cube Research, we've been discussing, you know, the threat landscape has been really evolving and very rapidly changing over the past few years, to put it mildly. And today, I think this is going to be a great discussion where we dive deeper into the importance of transparency in network and cyber security, and specifically examine how trust and confidence can be built by vendors into their products and solutions so that people can have more confidence going forward that they're really approaching cyber in a way that helps everyone and, you know, bigger tent type of uh, atmosphere. So let's kind of get into it with Suzanne. With your background being, you know, at the Department of Homeland Security, you really had a, a pretty unique viewpoint into this. And let's kind of dive into that a little bit and get your view on the need for secure data and IP being balanced with the need for more, uh, you know, no more secrets and what, you know, some will call fighting into the light or fighting in the light. What is that view? What's your view on that? And how do, how do people really, and vendors really balance that out? Yeah, thank you, Rob. Um, great to be here to chat with you. Um, so I, I do think it's important to put this conversation in that broader context. Uh, and I sort of coined this phrase, I talk about it as training to fight in the light. Um, and I've been talking about this since 2010 or or even earlier. And the notion is really pretty basic. If you train to fight in the dark, you could meet your adversary at night or you could turn off the lights and you'd have the advantage. Uh, I think we need to recognize that a transparent world is coming at us full steam ahead, one in which the lights are being turned on uh, all over the place. And whoever could figure out how to operate most effectively in a transparent world is gonna have the advantage. Right. That that is train. That's the notion of training to fight in the light. It is the idea that transparency is a great strength. Um, it's a great strength of democracies in contrast with authoritarian and totalitarian regimes. Right. Democracies are used to the imperatives for a transparency, whereas dictators need dark corners in which to hide secrets from their public. So we have an advantage. And we should lean into that advantage. It is also, part of that is also recognizing, coming to grips with that reality, that that is the world that's coming at us. And it is both because it is just increasingly difficult to keep secrets. The shelf life of secrets is vanishingly short. We are all aware of that. Um, but the costs of then trying to keep information secret. Uh, keep growing. Both the direct costs, the costs, uh, the, the amount of money that's being spent on cybersecurity, but also the indirect costs. And we'll talk about that today. The costs in terms of benefits that are lost by holding information close instead of sharing that information. And in the national security and homeland security world, we got uh, uh, schooled on that after 9-11 particularly, where the, we recognized that we needed to share that information with all of our defenders in order to increase our security. And we see that in cybersecurity. It is absolutely the case that we need to be sharing that information with all of our network defenders information, we need that radical transparency because our adversaries are networked and they are sharing information. We need to share information that can help all of us do a better job in cybersecurity. It's absolutely imperative. Yeah, no, I, I think that is key. I mean, we're seeing that not only nation states, but 
these bad actors are actually more or less incorporating as corporations and really uh, very well organized, uh, having hierarchies and being able to uh, act as small companies, almost like vendors on the other side of the fence here. Uh, but I, I think people may not really understand what does it really mean for transparency and what does transparency really mean, I guess you could say. And you've been an advocate for the importance of this in cybersecurity throughout your career. What, what does transparency look like in cyber and from a cyber vendor's perspective? Yeah, so it's on both sides. It is, it's, what, on one aspect of that is uh, you've got to assume uh, that, uh, and as I say, really take on board the difficulty of keeping information secret. And if you look, and therefore you've got to identify uh, and minimize the amount of information that you really need to protect, right? As opposed to trying to protect everything equally. And that's inherent in the NIST cybersecurity framework that starts with identify. Identify your truly high value assets. And then you can really focus your efforts on protecting that uh, kind of information. And it also then assumes uh, that in your planning, you have to assume that you're going to have a breach, right? And you've got to m figure out all the ways in which you're going to mitigate the consequences of that disruption, of that breach. Those are two ways in which understanding this radical world of transparency that we are in um, is important for cybersecurity. And then, as I said, on the flip side, making sure that then you are sharing everything you possibly can, leaning forward, um, that we are all sharing information about breaches, about vulnerabilities, uh, about what we know about threat information, um, so that we can have the kind of collective defense, which is really our only hope against an incredibly dynamic and evolving um, environment. Yeah, no, I, I think that is true. It becomes more dynamic, uh, it seems like, every day, and especially with AI, now we're getting clean malware versus really badly worded malware and stuff of that nature, which was a little bit easier to track, but you're getting to see it uh, you know, coming out of the LLMs and stuff of that nature. But let's bring Carl in on this, because I, I think I want to get you know, a vendor's perspective on what's going on. I mean, for Fort, you know, from a Fortinet perspective, how do you see that dynamic relationship between product security and the importance of transparency? Because you have intellectual property, you have trade secrets and things of that nature, but how do you, how do you strike the balance? Yeah, so, so Fortinet last year uh, shipped 50% uh, of all the worldwide firewalls. So we have a duty of care to our customers. We know that. So we have to really balance security um, at, with, with transparency. So how can we secure our products, but at the same time, get as much information out into the wild, exactly as uh, Suzanne said. So um, her point about fighting in the light is, is really important to us. And, and we have uh, we have a saying, which is sunlight is the greatest disinfectant. So we will uh, look at our products. We will look for vulnerabilities. We will work with our um, outside partners who are doing responsible disclosure. And the key thing is to uh, secure the products to look for the the issues that may lie to fix them rapidly, but then to get as much information out to the customer as possible. So they know, uh, give them the information that they need to assess the risk. And then most importantly is to, to upgrade when they need to. And if we don't give them that transparency, that radical transparency that Suzanne talked about, they can't make those risk decisions of when to upgrade, how quickly to upgrade. So that is why we've embraced working with our um, with the third party uh, responsible disclosure organizations, people who are providing us with information and then getting you know, the vulnerabilities we discover out uh, into the wild. Last year, we discovered 83 uh, percent of all of the vulnerabilities that we published were actually our own. And we're not hiding things. We're making sure that, that things that might others, other vendors may have published as being a crash or a, uh, a bug, we make sure that if there's any risk, we give our customers the information that they need to make that risk-based decision. No, that's great. And I, I think to that point, you know, I mean, my my morning reading over of email of CISA's, every uh, every vulnerability that's come out the night before or been published, you know, it's always, always fascinating to see. And I, I think as a community, it seems like certain organizations are doing a better job. So it's great to hear 
uh, how you, you know, Fortinet is leaning into that. But Suzanne, let's kind of bring you back in and, you know, continue on that thought. And what do you think is the best path forward here? And, you know, is more government, uh, I guess you could say, more involvement from government entities really the right path forward or something that should be done? Well, uh, let me start by saying I think government can play an important role here by encouraging the kind of uh, behavior that Carl has just described, which is for companies to be quick to get out information about their own vulnerabilities um, and not uh, government can help reduce the stigma attached with that. Right. Because everybody, every uh, everyone who's developing products there, the, nobody is coding perfectly. So there, everyone has vulnerabilities. And the only real difference is, are you being told about them as a customer? Are you getting the information that you need then to address and mitigate those vulnerabilities? And it's really imperative, I think, that government create an environment in which companies are strongly encouraged and rewarded uh, for getting this out. And I think CIS is doing a great job with that. If you look at their guidance on secure by design, one of their key uh, principles is this is called they call it radical transparency. And one of the things that they explicitly note in there is that when you first start implementing that, it is going to look ugly. And I remember this when I was the undersecretary at DHS, when we did it across government through our continuous diagnostics and monitoring program, we began to get much greater insights into what was happening on our government networks. And it was pretty ugly at first. Um, but it was better to get that information, get it out, share it widely in order to be able to improve things. And it was a sign of progress, frankly, that we saw these higher numbers uh, of you know, concerning um, incidents. And, I, and that is what, what we've got to help our, uh, the broader ecosystem uh, understand is that this radical transparency is gonna look ugly at first, but that is a good thing. Um, and it really has to be done that way. And then government needs to lead by example. Government needs to display that same radical transparency, be very transparent and quick about acknowledging breaches and, and vulnerabilities that they find. Yeah, no, I, I do like the work that uh, CISA has done. And I think again, you know, the White House had uh, kind of their foot in this this year with the national cybersecurity strategy that really again picked up on CISA and you know the secure by design and secure by default uh, aspects and, and again having been a product person myself and built software over the years I kind of look at it as that that's critical uh, to you know achieving your customers trust as well is that transparency. And I, I think that's a, a total key here, um, is that transparency is a key foundation to both elements, you know, secure by design and secure by default. Uh, you know, can you share your insights into what is meant by or how you're going to meet those goals for cybersecurity and how it's going to really be met from an industry perspective? From our point of view, I mean, secure by design is something that we've we've had in place for a long while. So it's about thinking about security really before you even write a line of code from the, right at the start where you just think of how you're going to design the system, what methodology you're going to use, threat model, what are the threats, what do you expect the threats to be on your product? So that's something that we've been doing for a long while at Fortinet. I think what what the whole secure by design, secure by default idea or concept is, is really to shift the balance from customers and the end users needing to you know, understand what can be sometimes a complex system and be able to configure it and use it in the right way. It's to try and shift that. And as the experts, the vendors ourselves, is to be able to build the product from the ground up in a secure manner and configured securely by default. One of the things we've always done uh, as vendors historically is create hardening guides. So build products that are simple for the customers to use and then have a hardening guide to make them uh, more uh, to more secure over time. We've got to change, move away from that and take the onus from the customer for, uh, for that initial secure configuration. So build 
build security into the product from um, from the start, and then have a you know a loosening guide is to change the way of thinking so that everything comes out of the box secure, and maybe they have to sort of disable some of the features that that we or or settings to make it you know, less secure but easier for them to use. It's a whole paradigm shift for the way that we operate in the cybersecurity space, I think. So, and one definitely that is going to benefit for a long time to come, It'd be a big benefit. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I think that again, you know, from uh, the past when I actually managed firewalls in a very distant past life. And when you look at it, you know, it's like you shut the ports off and let somebody complain about the port not being open kind of concept. But that was kind of the poor man's view of that back in the day when it was, we were just getting started with firewalls. But, you know, Carl, do, do you expect, you know, the rate of change to, you know, be challenged with this, you know, the, the pace of patches and disclosures, changes in code across the ecosystem really is, you know, I mean, pretty phonetic. I mean, especially in this where you're finding things. Do you expect that to change, you know, from an industry perspective or from a Fortinet perspective? Um, so I think the, the pace of change has got to continue. I think the difficulty for our customers is how they manage that pace of change. So we can create patches and continue to fix issues. Uh, but as we speak to our customers, you know, they they are finding the pace a little bit frenetic. I, I won't get away from, we can't get away from that. But it's so really what we need to do is to give them the tools that they need. One, to make the decision of whether they need to upgrade and how quickly they need to upgrade and then put other mitigations in place. So things like, well, can we help them with automatic upgrading? Um, to to uh, get them to the next release as rapidly as possible. Uh, can we help them with other tools like virtual patching technologies? Doesn't get away from uh, the need to upgrade, but it might give some breathing space uh, to allow them to get the, through that upgrade process. But this is another reason why that radical transparency is important because you've got to give the customers the level of information they need to be able to make those decisions. So give them the information as early as possible, as rapidly as possible, so they can make those risk-based decisions on whether to upgrade. Um, so yes, I think the pace has got to continue. Um, the It's okay to say, oh, I'm not going to patch uh, for this release, or I don't have time to patch, but threat actors are, are going to abuse that, uh, that gap between the update. So the more we can do to one, keep the pace, uh, keep the pace of fixing problems uh, and, and then giving the customers the information they need to make the risk-based decision, but then provide other tooling in between to try and uh, mitigate those risks. Um, things like the, the, patch, the virtual patching, as I mentioned, absolutely critical to the customers. Yeah, no, I, I mean, we, we like to say that, you know, Patch Tuesday has turned into Hack Wednesday. I mean, that's, uh, you know, and how do you really stay out of that loop? So, um, no, this has been, Fantastic, and I, I think again, you know, we've been talking to our customers and recommending, you know, radical transparency and actually, you know, rating your organ the organizations you work with on that radical transparency because I think again, that's one of the things that you want to see that they're participating in that. So I, I want to thank you both, Suzanne and Carl, for coming on board here. This has been a ton of fun, and you know, flew by. But I really appreciate you sharing some of the insights into that and what others can look for when they're looking at vendors. Thank you, thanks. thanks for the time. Thanks Rob. And thank you for watching this CUBE conversation. I'm your analyst and host, Rob Streche. You're watching the CUBE, your leader in enterprise technology news and analysis. See you soon.